I invite you to turn to the book of Luke as we've been going through this marvelous book together. Uh, Luke chapter 18 this morning. We're going to look and we've been following Jesus as he makes his way south from Galilee uh, in Luke's gospel to Jerusalem. He's turned his face toward Jerusalem and he is uh, there and we've, he's been talking in this section, uh, much talk in this section of several nine or ten chapters about the kingdom of God and how we enter the kingdom of God. And we saw last week how children, even children, covenant children can enter the kingdom of God, how we all need to be like children uh, in our dependency upon Christ to enter the kingdom. We also looked at the uh, rich ruler who uh, walked away from Jesus because he had so much and Jesus asked him to give up everything to follow him. And we must give up everything as well to follow Christ, and he introduces that, that image of it's harder for a, a rich man to uh, enter the kingdom of God as, as a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And uh, they were confused by that because uh, they thought if anybody in Israel would be saved, it would be rich people because that showed God's blessing. They he had been prosperous, and so they must have the favor of God. They must be saved. And Jesus said, no, it's hard for them to be saved entering the kingdom because there's so many distractions for them. And then we also saw Jesus' prediction of uh, the fact that to enter the kingdom of God, he must go and suffer and die and rise again. And now Jesus comes uh, to Jericho, the site of, you might remember, of the walls tumbling down in, in the days of Joshua. This is the same Jericho uh, uh, there. And, and it's also a, a place about 20 miles or so southwest of Jerusalem. And uh, if you can think of the geography of that, it's uh, going down. It's, it's 20, 20 miles southwest, but it's 4,200 feet below Jerusalem. So you're just coming down a shift uh, uh, slide uh, ridge and, and, uh, and a mountain, really, is what it is. And Jerusalem, uh, Jericho rather, is 825 feet below sea level. So it's a, it was sort of the Palm Springs of, is, of, of Israel at that time. It, it was known for its warm, dry climate. It was known uh, for its uh, just really uh, worldwide known balsam trees, uh, had great water supply. It was one of, and has been, one of the oldest continuing inhabited cities of the entire world. Jer Jericho has been there for a long time and very much a part of the West Bank today um, there. I, I, I won't go on to this, but uh, Susie, uh, John's, my cousin John's uh, wife and I and, and Andrew went to Jericho and it was, uh, it was like coming into, uh, we got out of the taxi and, and everyone looked at us because we were the only white people there. You know, we were the only people that were Western people there and they looked at us like an in, out of an Indiana Jones film or something uh, there. But it's, it's still there today. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, a, a place of great wealth at the time of Jesus because it, w it, f it was on the, the main route from Jerusalem down the, the mountain and on to the east. And so wealthy people lived there. It was kind of a, a wealthy resort for the rich in the, in the wintertime. And a, a great place for beggars and for tax collectors to thrive is Jericho. And Luke groups two stories together, and they really are brought together. Um, they could be preached apart, but they really, he puts them together. Two stories about two very different men, a poor, blind beggar and a, a rich, powerful uh, tax collector. And both men wanted to see Jesus. Uh, both end up seeing Jesus, even literally as the blind man has his sight. But they end up seeing Jesus because Jesus sees them. And Jesus hears and discovers them. And so it's true for that reason. Also, both men are in great need of, of help. They are lost in different ways. Uh, both men encounter Jesus as he's passing by. There's kind of a focus on the, Jesus is about ready to go by and almost bypassing them. And yet he doesn't. He stops for both of them. Uh, both are changed forever. Both men are rejected by others. There's a group, there's an antagonistic group in each of these stories that uh, makes an objection. And uh, watch for that. Uh, both stories really are about salvation. And there's a Greek word. I just ended up talking to someone about how sometimes the translation is so good that, but, that knowing Greek or being able to work through the Greek 
uh, doesn't make all that much difference. But here it does make great difference. The, the word sozo is in both stories. And it's in verse 42 where Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Literally, your faith has saved you. That word can mean heal or save. And then the final verse of the passage, really a Jesus' mission statement in verse 10 of chapter 19, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. So the, the word save brings the stories together. Uh, the man is healed. Uh, Jesus does an impossible thing in both stories. He heals the blind man and he saves a rich man, which for them would have been a, 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 a great, great thing. And both uh, stories are about salvation. One cries for mercy, the other receives salvation that very day. So the first story emphasizes something. The first story will emphasize the nature and the necessity of faith in our salvation. The second story emphasizes the pursuit, the calling of Jesus in our salvation. And so the first story deals largely with, with the responsibility that we have to believe and trust in Christ. The second story, the great sovereignty of God in our salvation to make it all happen. So uh, what saving faith is in the first story, why we have that saving faith in the second story, the pursuit uh, of Jesus, and then in the second story, being pursued by, by Jesus. There's two key actions in both stories. The blind man cries out, and he won't stop crying out, and the, and the God man in the second story looks up and he sees Zacchaeus there. They're great stories, and they're tied together so that we can know more of our salvation. So hear the word of the Lord, and this is the word of the Lord uh, from uh, Luke's uh, Gospel, uh, chapter 18. I'll begin reading at, at verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to, to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost so ends the reading of God's word let's let's uh, pray together father we ask that you would help us now in this moment in this time we've come to hear your word may the preacher preach that word may he not deviate from that word may he stick to the text and by doing so, feed your people. Lord, may we, again, come back to these days that truly happened. The days in which you spoke and walked and healed and saved. And may those days be now our days as we turn to you in faith. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> have you ever wondered and thought about what it would have been like to meet Jesus? 
face to face. I'm sure everybody who's a Christian has wondered that sometime. What would it be like to meet Jesus for the very first time? What would you notice about him if you first met him? What would it be? Would it be his piercing eyes, yet loving eyes? Would it be his voice, the tone of his voice? What would first strike you? Perhaps the way Jesus holds himself in all these situations. Certainly his awareness of others and not of himself. So much of what we do is about ourselves. But Jesus was the man for others, as Bonhoeffer said. The one who lived for others. And what that must have looked like, even in seeing him in everyday life. A man who was totally given up his life and yet was so full of life that it was just coming forth from him. A man of intensity, maybe that's what you would have noticed. He came to seek and to save the lost. And yet that intensity didn't push people away. It drew them to him. Well, Luke presents us with two men who meet Jesus for the very first time and they're forever changed. First, the blind man in verses 35 through 43, he was about his business that day. Uh, strategically stationed somewhere where he thought he would get the handout he needed, taking in every sound that was going for. He was a blind man holding out his hand in some way. Matthew tells us that this same story, uh, there were two blind men, actually. Luke is not lying. He's just not focusing on that. He's bringing us a narrower scope. And Mark, rather, tells us that this man's name was Bartimaeus. It was just another day for him on the roadside. Uh, Then a crowd comes, uh, a large crowd. Both emphasize, Matthew and Mark particularly emphasize the the, the large crowd that they were heading. They were going up to Jerusalem. They were going to the Passover. And Jesus was in the crowd. And the man asked, you know, what's happening? Well, they said, well, Jesus is passing by. And he doesn't want to miss it. This is his one opportunity. And he calls out to Jesus. Uh, even though others are telling him, stop it, be quiet, be quiet. And then he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't stop at all. And, and then Jesus stops, though. And he wants the man to come to him. He calls the man to him. He, he wants to talk to this poor uh, outcast of his society. And he asks him, what do you want? And he says, I want to see. And Jesus says, receive your sight. And he did. And he, but it also says, and Jesus says, because you believe. What does the story really tell us and teach us? Certainly that Jesus has the power to heal and to do the impossible. Uh, certainly that Jesus is compassionate for the outcast and the weak and the hurting. Certainly that Jesus cares enough to stop his day to help them. But the emphasis is on the man's faith, if you look at it closely. Yes, yes, it's all about those things, but it's on his faith. Your faith has healed you. The story is telling us something about true faith, the necessity of faith in being healed, of being saved, because that means the same thing. That's what Jesus is saying. The the healings, by the way, they, they... They look there to show us the compassion of Christ in Jesus' day. They look forward to the day where there will be no no, uh, need for healing, for we'll be healed all the time. But in the meantime, they're showing us something about salvation. And this passage is showing us about faith and how we enter the kingdom of God through faith. And I'm going to give you quickly just five little quick points that Jesus Uh, uh, meets this man, and this man cries out in faith to Jesus. And we're told in Scripture, what? Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We must call upon the Lord. Faith is calling upon him to save us. Secondly, this man knew what he needed. He didn't just call out. He called out for what? Mercy. He needed mercy. He didn't deserve anything. He knew he didn't deserve anything. And yet he asked for it. He knew he wanted to see, to be saved. There's this subtle connection throughout the Gospels of the physical healing that really happened and the salvation, the spiritual healing, and that those are connected together and that he couldn't see because he lived in a sinful world. Adam and Eve could see and there was no one in the garden that was blind. 
And we're moving toward that, way, that place where blindness and all the things that are happening, but we're moving that through Jesus. Uh, a total healing is where uh, this world is headed. And this man had some understanding of that. He knew he needed mercy. He didn't demand it. He didn't say, Jesus, you have the power, so you de- I deserve to be, be healed. He said, give me mercy. Give me mercy. And he looked forward uh, to that, and he wanted that. And he calls to Jesus, son of David, right? That's a key phrase. Uh, it was synonymous with saying, you're the Messiah in Jesus' day. It wasn't uh, just something he thought up of in the time. When people talked about the son of David, they were talking about the Messiah. This man was confessing Jesus as the Messiah. As Jesus said in, when he uh, was in the Nazareth, uh, and uh, he quotes from Isaiah 61, and the blind will, be, will cover sight in the days of the Messiah. This man was blind. He put it together. Jesus was the Messiah. And therefore he could heal him. There's great pr- passages of that. Isaiah 29, 18. In that day the deaf will hear, and out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Or Isaiah 35, 5. Uh, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf be stopped. This is what the Messiah would do. And he was placing his faith in who Jesus was, expecting that to happen. Notice the contrast. The crowd says Jesus is what? From Nazareth, his hometown. But the man says Jesus is the Messiah. And, And Luke wants us to see that contrast. We must come to the point where we're saying Jesus is the Messiah. He's not just a man. He's not just from Nazareth. But he's the son of David. And then, of course, thirdly, this man wouldn't give up. He keeps on calling out. And faith, true faith, continues to pursue Jesus until we find him. To pursue salvation until we find it. Not to just simply say, I'll give a casual search. I'll look a little bit. I'll listen a couple times. No. The ones who find, Jesus say, says, are the ones who are seeking and continually seeking. And Jesus will save us as we call out to him in faith. He will stop for us as we cry out to him in faith. He will take away the darkness. He will heal us. He will save us. He will let us see him. The man, first thing he saw was what? Jesus. And when we trust in Christ, we see Jesus and all his glory and all that, what he did for us. And then fourthly, the man followed Jesus. He followed Jesus up the, the side of the, the, the mountain there, up into Jerusalem, praising God. And so must all who trust in Christ. Where would that that uh, road lead this blind man or now healed man to the very same place it was taking Jesus. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem not to sit and have a good time with Pilate and Herod and eat and drink and be merry. He was going there to suffer, to be rejected, to die. And so we follow him there. Everyone who trusts in Christ follows him there. It's interesting that there's an um, a apocrypha writing of uh, uh, the Acts of Pilate. There was some of the early church fathers, uh, Justin in 150 AD, Jesus dies in about 30, 33 AD, has a, 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 believes that there was some kind of report that Pilate gave to the emperor about Jesus' death. And this has been found. We're not sure if it's, it's, it goes back to the beginning because we don't have any solid evidence. But st- at least uh, 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 Justin, and, uh, Justin Martyr and Tertullian believe that there was such a report. And in it, it says, we have an uh, uh, older copy of it. It says, and another Jew came at the trial of Jesus when Jesus was before Pilate. And he hastened forward and said, I was born blind. I heard And I heard man's voice, but I could not see his face. And as Jesus passed by, I cried with a loud voice, Have mercy on me, son of David. And he took pity on me and put his hands on my eyes, and I saw immediately. It's possible that there were people that were testifying to Jesus 
at his trial, not just the ones who the scriptures uh, uh, give us of, of, uh, against that, uh, against Jesus. But either way, this man followed Jesus, and we must follow him. We must enter, enter the kingdom of God. What does Paul say? But we must go through many sorrows. It's a frightening world we live in. It's even more frightening to be a believer in such a world. And one day we will have to, have to stand for Christ. Maybe it's the day is coming closer than we think. I read a story this week. Uh, I wasn't going to bring this in, but we'll bring it in here. Uh, of, of, of a true story of, of guys that came into time in, I think it was in Romania, and Christians were, were worshiping, and it was not popular. In fact, it was prohibited to worship. And men came into that worship service, and they had their AK-40s, and they said, anybody is going to be, everyone will be killed unless you leave right now and renounce Jesus as Savior. And a few looked at each other, and a few laughed. And then they closed the doors behind, because most of the congregation stayed. And these guys said, well, we're Christians too. We just had to make sure that there were no hypocrites among you before we'd worship with you. We, we have to follow Christ, no matter what. This man followed Christ into Jerusalem, probably was there through all the events. Maybe he was there at the trial, who knows? But he followed Christ, and we must as well. And that's what faith does. It cries out in faith. It knows it needs mercy. It follows Christ. It trusts him. Well, look at the second story in chapter 19. Uh, this second encounter, this second impossibility, uh, this second uh, 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 healing, uh, this, this rich man, Zacchaeus. It's only found in Luke's gospel. And you were told right away that there are about five facts about him. He was wealthy, right? Number two, he, he was a tax collector. And remember, we talked about that. Tax collectors were not like tax collectors today uh, are. Uh, we don't really like tax collectors, but they're not evil people. Uh, at least most of them, I don't believe, are. But tax collectors were thought of in Jesus' day like a murderer. They were, they were the people who sold out their people for a better living. Uh, they were the ones who collected the taxes for Rome, who was occupying the land. And so they were thought of as, as, as traitors, as predators upon uh, the people. I, I think the closest thing to a tax collector today is a pedophile who sells out children, our children, for the sake of their own pleasures. And we dis we're disgusted by that. And they were disgusted by tax collectors. These men were not only traitors, they were cheaters. If Rome wanted two coins, they would ask for three and pocket the one. And he was a chief tax collector. In other words, he organized other tax collectors. He was the worst of all tax collectors. And then we're told that he was what? Short. I can't relate to that, but he was short. He was short. Uh, others can. Claudia can, as she says there. Um, Remember this uh, Sunday school song, uh, The Wee Little Man Was He? Remember that? He's a short man, but he was a bad man. Uh, in fact, Kent Hughes says he was the baddest, smallest, meanest man in town. That's what Zacchaeus was. And he had wants, but he wants to, the fifth fact is that he wants to see Jesus. And he can't see him because he's too short. He can't see over the crowd. And nobody was going to let him forward. This was just the fact that he was entering a crowd of people he had stolen from and that they hated him was a big deal. He probably got a couple jabs and a couple toes stepped on in the process. No way they're going to let him up front to see Jesus. But Zac Zacchaeus hadn't become a chief lecturer for nothing. He was a clever man. He always had a plan. He always seemed to be one step ahead of everybody else. And he was ahead of step here. And he goes to this sycamore tree, which is not like the sycamore trees we have now. We have tall smaller branched uh, sycamore tree. This is a tree more of the mulberry variety that uh, has long limbs where you could, and lateral limbs where you could sit upon them. Look it up this uh, on the web. You'll see a, a picture like a, a tree that Zacchaeus would have sat in. And it tells us that he ran to it. I mean, that's just strange. You don't see wealthy uh, godfathers running, <laughs> uh, you know, to something. They, they, no one does that if they think they are the baddest, meanest person in town. But he ran to this tree. Interesting detail Luke brings in there. 
he, like the blind beggar, was not going to be denied. denied. He was going to see Jesus that day. But the this, this story has a turn in it in the fact that Jesus sees him. And Jesus calls him by name. They'd never met, but Jesus knew his name. And he calls him by that name. And I love the way Luke describes it. That when Jesus reached the spot, literally the place, the Greek has it, uh, it, and there was, it gives us the, 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 he came just to the spot where Zacchaeus was, but just the spot where Jesus needed to be to save him. Zacchaeus' plan is to see Jesus, but, but Jesus' plan is to save Zacchaeus. And Jesus stops right on that spot. And he looks up. You can just see it looking up. And he doesn't just look up and say, well, don't you want to ask me something, Zacchaeus? Don't you want to uh, invite me over to dinner today? That, that's not what Jesus says, is it? Jesus commands him. Jesus would, in normal circumstances, this would be rude. But Jesus commands him because he's saving him. He's calling him down. He doesn't say, I'm going to wait here until you ask me over for dinner. Uh, he was definitive. Come down. I must stay in your house this very day. Not tomorrow, not another day, not someday, but this very day. I'm not waiting for you to ask me anything. Jesus had decided to save Zacchaeus. And so it is with us. When Jesus calls us to himself, he pursues us. He will not take no for an answer, ultimately. He's like, as someone put it, the hound of heaven who seeks and saves the lost. In his confessions, Augustine said of God, you follow close behind the runaway the sinner and recall us to yourself in ways we cannot understand. We find this all through scripture. Remember Lydia, the Lord opened her heart to believe. Think of Romans 9, 16. Paul says it does not depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. It's not because we want Jesus, although we end up wanting him. It's because Jesus has first come to us and opened our hearts to him. John in his first chapter of, uh, says that all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. They are brought to life by God. Jesus is bringing Zachariah, Zacchaeus uh, to life in this time. And Jesus may be calling you, calling you back, seeking you. Remember that Jesus sees you. He sees you where you are and where you're hiding. And he knows you by name. Come down from that place. Come down from that place of hiding. And he will save you. He'll save you from yourself. He'll save you from the life of living for yourself. He'll save you from the consequences of living such a life when we've been made to serve God. And he will never, ever lose you. Never. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been or who you are. Jesus loves to save sinners. He gives grace to the lost. Not to the found, to the lost. To those who know they are lost and headed in the wrong direction, even headed to hell. He saves that kind of person. To people who have had a thousand chances to get it right and have gotten it wrong over and over again. That's the kind of person he saves. He saves tax collectors. People who sell out others for their own purposes. We've all done that in some way. Jesus gives grace to those who don't deserve it. That's what grace is, of course. Something we don't deserve. In that sense, grace is always, God's grace is always scandalous. Scandalous. And that's why they mutter in this story. You're going to whose house? You're going to save who? Zacchaeus? We hate that guy. He's been so terrible to our family. We've, we're in poverty, some of us, because of him. Grace is always scandalous. Remember the story of the prodigal son? One son goes away, gives up everything, 
blows it big time. The other son, the older son stays home. But both the sons are lost in different ways. And the young man, uh, one person put it this way, uh, uh, Cornelius uh, Plantica puts it this way. One young son left home. The older son froze the home. It's hard to say which was further from God. And when the father forgives the son when he comes back, the older son resents above all the amazing grace that the father gives. For some reason, his father isn't interested in getting even or in getting his money back or in shortening the prodigal's leash. The end of the story has nothing to do with a heart-to-heart talk in which God says to the prodigal, look, Sylvester, there is a little matter here of reestablishing your credit history so I can hold up my head in the village again. Nothing like that. The end of the story is a hilarious party, a feast, a neighborhood blowout with music and hot food and dancing. And what about the sourball who objects to all this hoopla? The older son. God has, uh, God has to explain that the name of the game isn't bookkeeping anymore, but resurrection. The father says to the older son, lighten up, Harold, find the punch bowl, put on a funny hat, come inside. Somebody you know has just come back from the dead. And yet there's this this muttering, even in Jesus' story here, that God is giving grace to those who don't deserve it. That's what it's all about, brothers and sisters. That's what it's about in your life. It's all just a matter of degree. We all need God's grace. Zacchaeus needed God's grace. You need God's grace. There's always going to be the people, though, who say you can't save those people. Don't you know what they've done? Don't you know that they'll sin against you, God, again and again? Don't you know that they'll take advantage of you, God? And God still gives grace. God still gives grace. And that's why it's so scandalous. And what's the answer to such questions? What's the answer to the mutterers who say God can't do that? Well, the first answer is that God can do whatever he wants to do. He can give the gift he wants to anyone he give, wants to give it. It's his prerogative to give that gift. But more in this story, there's a second answer for this cheap grace objection. And that is the answer that Zacchaeus gives in verse 8. Notice that Jesus doesn't answer the mutterers. Zacchaeus does. And Zacchaeus says, and stood up, He said to the Lord right then, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions away. If I've cheated anyone, I'll give them four times the amount back. That's the answer to the mutterers. That grace doesn't just pardon. It doesn't just forgive. It does that. But it changes the hearts of those who are forgiven. It reworks us from the inside out over a lifetime. That grace re does us sin by sin, year by year. It, grace breaks our heart so that we're willing to let go of what we held on so, to so tightly. And it makes us sons and daughters. And Jesus makes a big declaration there. He says, Zacchaeus, who's not even allowed to go into the temple, tax pillars couldn't even go in. They were considered unclean. This guy, Now, because of what I've done for him and saved him, now he's a son of Abraham. He's a true Jew. He's a true follower of the Lord. And so grace makes us that. Makes us go, as Zacchaeus goes, beyond the expected, beyond even the law. The law said, for some things you give four times, but not everything. He went beyond that. The law says give to the poor, but it doesn't say give 50%. He went beyond that. And that's what grace does to us. The text is not trying to tell us how to give to the church. That's not the point. It's not a paradigm for giving. But it shows us what grace does to people. The point is that God can save anyone. He can do the impossible. Because he's done it in our lives. He's saved us. He can save you. Even today. 
since Christ came to save Zacchaeus, this rich oppressor, he can save anyone. He does the impossible. He saves the proud. He saves those who hang on and are greedy about money. He saves and can save anyone. As we close, let me, let me ask you this question. Do you think it's possible for God to have saved Ted Bundy? Do you think it's possible that God could have the last moment in the bunkers of, of Berlin saved an Adolf Hitler? This pushes our idea of grace to the limits, doesn't it? To ask such questions. We can say yes only if God saves by grace. Because if God saves by works, if God saves by Christian character, no way could those men ever be passing God's judgment. But because it's grace, anyone who turns to Christ, anyone, no matter who they are or what they've done, can come. Grace is the only way into the kingdom. Jesus is the only way into the kingdom because he came to seek and to save the lost. He came to die and rise for the lost. Are you lost? Are you one of the impossibles? Then listen to his call to you today. Jesus is still speaking from his word to you and he's calling you down from the safe place you think you're in to the hiding place from him. He's calling you down as he called Zacchaeus and he's calling you by name. He sees you in all your life and all your games and that you play and all the rationalizations that you make. And he's reaching out to you. He knows, he knows you. And he's seeking you. He's calling you by name today. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would help us again to come back to that faith that trusts you and calls for mercy to you, to that realization that you save us, we don't save ourselves, that you come to us and we don't come to you, or we only come to you because you come to us. We only choose you because you've chosen us. Lord, may we come back to grace today. May we hear you call us by name. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.